Hello again and welcome to the start of a small little project I plan on doing. Um, you may have noticed that probably my favourite thing to do here in this lab is blow stuff up. But my second favourite thing is to turn everyday objects or everyday sort of things you don't see as chemicals into useful chemicals. Um, a lot of them are, are carcinogens, so I'm turning everyday objects into carcinogens. That's um, what I seem to like doing. So we've done that with cutlery so far, we've done that with um, Panadol and Paracetamol, we've, we've turned into things. I'm just because I like, you know, I like seeing the world as, as chemicals, you know. So in this project we're making probably the most typical carcinogen, which is benzene. Now benzene is a very good solvent and was used everywhere probably oh, 20 years ago. You know, uh, school and, and um, university and that sort of thing. But now um, it was discovered it was a carcinogen, so they banned it from all universities. And you know, like I've never seen benzene, you know, no one in my degree has seen benzene before in their life. So, um, I mean, apart from there's a small fraction of it in petrol, but ignoring that. So we'll explain a bit more of benzene production in a later video, but the chemical we're wanting out of today is terea phthalic acid. I think I'm saying it right anyway. You know my pronunciation is shit. Um, and how we're getting from that is from PET, which is the plastic used for um, drink containers. And a few other things. Not every drink container is PET. Um, your milk containers are high density polyethylene. Um, you can tell because on these bottles they do have a little symbol, it's a bit hard to see, but here in Australia at least anyway, it's the one in the little arrows and PET written underneath. It's probably the same everywhere but it might be different. Um, in this milk iced coffee container it has a 2 with HDPE written on it, so that's a load of shit. So up here we have our PET, which has the terephthalic acid as well as ethylene glycol. Um, that's the monomer there, um, and it just links up into very long chains. So it's obviously a polymer. Um, PET stands for polyethylene tetraphthalic acid because we've got ethylene glycol and tetraphthalic acid. So, and we want it, yeah. So obviously we want this um, tetraphthalic acid, and that's a solid, and this is, um, you know, a liquid, obviously ethylene glycol. Um, so this, in all respects looks like a simple hydrolysis reaction. We just cleave this bond here, add, add water, um, and then we get this. Um, the, the problem remains that this is actually quite a difficult hydrolysis reaction. And we know that because um, <laughs> we use it every day. You know, like I, I can store, you know, a large variety of chemicals in it. Like here we have our distilled hydrochloric acid. It's not affected. Obviously things like sodium hydroxide will get to it eventually, but I'm from what I read, it's a very, very slow reaction at room temperature. In fact, you know, so, um, aqueous solutions of um, sodium hydroxide can take weeks to sort of break down it to you know, a reasonable extent. Um, so we, I, I do have weeks, but we want to do this rather quickly. So instead of using water or methanol or something as a solvent, because um, you know, we can't get it that hot because, you know, we're limited by its temperature that it refluxes at. We're going to use something with a much higher boiling point. This is ethylene glycol. It boils at about 200 degrees, 199 degrees, I think. Typically green, um, it's because it's used in, in coolants in cars, and you can buy basically pure ethylene glycol um, from the store. I did have a big four litre bottle that I bought about four years ago. I think my dad's been a total scumbag and actually used it for its intended purpose um, as a coolant in cars. So we're gonna use his expensive coolant instead. This is um, basically 100% um, ethylene glycol according to MSDS, but there's one to 5% of something called sodium um, ethyl hexanoate or something like that. I hopefully won't interfere. Um, we'll be aware of it, but it shouldn't be too bad. What I really should do is I should distill the ethylene glycol out of this, that'll leave the dye and whatever the other sodium salt is behind. But you know what, I'm not going to bother. Um, sue me. <laughs> but um, hopefully it shouldn't interfere with this dye. Um, and if we plan it right, we should end up with pure ethylene glycol anyway, which we can distill out of this mix later on. So we've got these two bottles here. Hopefully we'll be trying to use all of these up. Um, so we're going to cut these into pieces and then chuck them in the blender because I can't really chuck in the blender at the moment because it does this. So 
So it turns out plastic bottles don't really blend that well. So I spent over an hour uh, chopping these bottles up into little pieces with a pair of scissors. But it's okay because I caught up on all of Nile Red's recent videos. So um, the hour was well spent anyway. So we're going to try to blend it again now. If it doesn't blend, um, we'll just use it as is. Alright, after being in the blender for quite a while, you can see that the blender really didn't make a huge difference to it. Um, and it was mostly just because I cut it up into pieces, it looks like this. Um, but these pieces, because they're really thin, it should be good enough anyway. Alright, so we've got 54 grams of PET. Um, so we're going to add 30 grams of sodium hydroxide, which is roughly 1.2 um, molar excess. You know, we'll have, a, have an excess to make sure we... Um, uh, drive the um, reaction a bit better. Um, now, one of the big issues with this um, reaction is that we have quite a concentrated solution of sodium hydroxide at reasonably high temperatures, 200 or so degrees. And I'm fairly sure if I ran it into a in a glass, it would etch the glass pretty seriously. In fact, probably destroying it. Um, well, like, like, you know, really seriously frosting it. Um, and it's not really safe to run it in something like that. So we're running it in this um, steel Milo container. Definitely make sure it's steel, not aluminium. We're gonna make sure it's not aluminium before adding the um, sodium hydroxide. But yeah, we've done that. Um, I've got a lid. I'm gonna cut a little hole out so I can put a condenser in there. Um, but uh, yeah, so we have to run this in, in a steel container. We can't really run it in glass, um, which is a bit annoying. Um, this container might get quite etched. Um, but that's okay. We obviously also can't use Teflon stir bars. Concentrated sodium hydroxide at these temperatures also might um, ruin the Teflon stir bars. So we're um, going to have to do it without stirring as well. All right, the blue ethylene um, glycol is in there. Um, there's not heaps of excess solvent. I have a feeling it's going to take a very long time to heat up, so during this time we're going to be cutting the hole out of our uh, um, lid. Alright, we're about half an hour into the reaction. Uh, it's smoking quite a lot. Um, it's a weird reddy brown colour. The blue coloration uh, left after about 10 minutes. Uh, the blue coloration of ethylene glycol. Um, <laughs> there's definitely the smell of burning and melting plastic, which is quite unpleasant. So we have the lid here. Um, this is actually, in there is the neck from one of my 250ml um, round bottom two neck flask that I broke during the uh, Nitroform video. And this will allow us to um, now um, stick a condenser on, but also later um, put the whole distillation apparatus out of this. Um, but that's a little while away. We'll get the condenser working, hopefully the, um, the smoke and the smell dies down a bit. Okay, the condenser's attached, we're about an hour in and it's refluxing pretty steadily. Um, you can't really see on the camera, but um, I can see that it's it's um, condensing in the condenser and dripping back down. Um, so we're going to leave this for uh, three or so hours until I get tired of this and want to go to bed. Um, and then uh, at that point I'll take it apart and we'll have a look at it and um, see how much of the plastic we've actually dissolved. Alright, so I ended up refluxing it for about four hours. So let's finally crack it open and take a look what's inside. So as soon as I took off the condenser there was quite an unpleasant smell coming from this. Um, it's really not really that strong, but it's sort of, it's vaguely familiar. It's like, um, it smells kind of like if you took a fish, I guess, and wrapped it in glad wrap, and then sort of uh, set it on fire, and then left it out in the sun for about three days. That's the kind of smell we're getting. It's like, you know, a combination of fish and, and burnt plastic. I don't know. There's this horrible sort of soupy brown um, liquid on top of all these white bits of plastic. Now I'm hoping that these bits of plastic I can just crunch and um, they should all just be well, sodium for talate. Okay so all those pieces of plastic in there are no longer plastic they're really fragile um, white things and hopefully they're actually all sodium tetraphthalate which has reasonably low solubility in the ethylene glycol I'm fairly sure. So we've got some water here, we've got some of this white um, stuff and we're gonna And after a minute of shaking, we can see that it all actually dissolves in the water. So that confirms that um, the white solid in there is no longer PET, but sodium terephthalate, um, which is now water soluble. So it's strange that this hydrolysis reaction took place and all the um, bits of plastic retain their shape, um, despite um, 
now being a crumbly solid. I guess that's the, the consequence of not having any stirring. But I thought the um, the reflux sort of violence would break it all up. Um, I did actually notice this happening about an hour in when I took the part to um, stir it. Um, not, not so much an hour, probably two hours in. Um, so the, the reaction was probably complete after two hours, so it probably didn't need to go for the four hours. But um, I saw that and I thought they were all bits of PET still. So the end goal is benzene, so we don't actually need to isolate this sort of intermediate um, terephthalic acid. But I do have here seven grams of sodium terephthalate. Um, this is important because um, we have to adjust our yield calculations later on because I've taken this out of there. Um, so me and you got to remember this, it's seven grams. Um, and we're going to dissolve this in a bit of water. All right, I did a quick gravity filter just because there was some floaties still left in there that it wouldn't quite dissolve. Um, so we have sodium terephthalate in our solution. So now all it is left to do is to add a um, mineral acid of your choosing, in which case my choosing is hydrochloric. And we see that we precipitate out our virtually insoluble terephthalate, terephthalic acid. Yeah, chunky. Oh yeah. And here is our final product of a few grams of terephthalic acid. Um, so I filtered it out, washed it with water a few times to get rid of all the other um, impurities, and then I washed it with methanol to uh, help it dry, which resulted in a bit of a loss. You can see it down the bottom, but um, you know, I don't actually need this for anything, but uh, this is the point of the video, so <laughs> um, yeah. So here is our terephthalic acid, which is obviously, as you can see, quite um, properties of it is a white powder, which is quite far removed from a PET plastic, which is of course very interesting. Um, the field of polymers isn't really my area, but uh, you know it's quite interesting, and uh, how you know um, we can turn this white powder into you know the plastic that is stored in. Um, you know, and the invention of them really drove a lot of the modern world. Um, plastics and polymers. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully we can uh, find some time soon to uh, keep processing this and uh, recover our glycol and um, start making some benzene, um, which will be exciting. So yeah, thanks for watching.